I think it's great. Okay, now we will talk about experiments to investigate phonon nuclear coupling and related effects. There were a new picture for exciting and de-exciting atomic nuclei. Okay, you have 20 minutes, not 200. <coughs> okay, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, my name is Florian Metzler. I work with Professor Peter Hegelstein and CN Liu at MIT, and we represent the Energy Production and Conversion Group. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview first before motivating our work a little more so, so you have a sense where this is leading up to. So the, at the uh, core, our experiments involve a steel clamp with a <clears throat> radioactive isotope, and we apply mechanical stress to that sample. And what we believe is happening, and I'm going to substantiate that, um, is that when the stress is applied, there's a delocalization of the photon emission from the plate um, for the lower energy lines, and there's a angular anisotropy effect um, of the photon emission for the higher energy lines. Okay, so how do we come up with this and why do we think this is happening? So let me take a step back and this is the, gonna be the structure of my talk. I will motivate um, this research, then talk about theory and predictions by theory, which inform the experimental setup. Um, then I will present the data that we took and uh, I close with the interpretation and next steps. <clears throat> so condensed matter nuclear science uh, really encapsulates real well what, what we're doing um, in, in this work. And you can approach it from two directions. One is from, you can come from condensed matter physics, and you can ask yourself, what is it that phonons do? And it's well known that phonons can um, interact with electrons, um, and there's phonon photon coupling, there's phonon spin coupling. So almost naturally the question arises, what else can phonons do? What else can phonons couple to interact with? Um, and you can also approach our work from the nuclear science field, um, and uh, you can ask yourself, uh, what is it that uh, can lead to the excitation and de-excitation of atomic nuclei? And here also conventionally, um, what, what is very widely accepted, of course, is that you can use photons to get nuclei in excited states, and also when nuclei fall back down into lower excited states or ground state, then they will emit photons, and you can also do this with energetic particles, and of course you change your nuclei in the process. Um, so that's well accepted, but then there's this whole large literature on anomalies that uh, suggest that there is a relationship or an impact of condensed matter environments on nuclear processes, and uh, this actually goes back, at least I speak about the published literature here, goes also back before Fleischmann and Ponce, uh, goes back into um, the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> There's also this emerging literature, really an emerging literature now on phonon engineering or what's alternatively called phononics or nanophononics, which is really part of mainstream condensed matter physics and, um, or a subfield of that discipline. And um, I'm particularly interested in a paper here by Foltz et al., which is a, a, a survey paper by about 20 authors. And um, just to give you a sense <coughs> uh, of some of the language used in, in this paper, so People talk about engineering nanostructures um, to have better control over phonons. Um, they emphasize the ever-increasing importance of phonons and uh, even predict that some novel insights into fundamental questions of physics may result from this, so where this subfield is leading to. And um, so they recommend to establish phononics as a transversal research topic. Um, and so I think it's <clears throat> really interesting to see this kind of dynamics and openness towards innovation from um, a mainstream field, and I think that may provide some opportunities to, to connect with. Um. So coming back to phonon nuclear coupling, um, so in response to some of the questions that are raised by the previous slides, um, <clears throat> different theorists have proposed an interaction between nuclei and condensed matter environments. and. Um, Professor Hegelstein, uh, in particular, discovered um, what he called phononuclear coupling and uh, later noticed that it can actually be derived directly from the Dirac equation for the multiparticle nucleus and was already noticed in the 1930s but was not further pursued because it was considered not relevant for the path of nuclear physics, accelerator-based physics um, that, um, that was pursued at the time. Um, so I'm going to skip over a lot of the theory stuff, or I'm going to review it quickly. I wanted to have it in there, but I actually talked about this at ICCF 
20 in Japan, and, and Professor Hegelstein, of course, talked about it many times. But I think my key takeaway point here is really that um, you have the many particle uh, Dirac model of the nucleus, and um, if you um, uh, apply the assumption that the motion of the nucleus macroscopically is, not, is re uh, non relativistic and the motion of uh, nucleons inside the nucleus are relativistic, then uh, you end up uh, almost uh, automatically with uh, this uh, coupling, which is the, the phonon nuclear coupling. Um, okay, so what does that mean um, with respect to the anomalies? Um, one thing that's really helpful about this um, approach is that you can now uh, uh, quantify uh, this, your phonon nuclear coupling. You can actually uh, make models and um, um, and determine the phononuclear coupling strength. And here's a, the simplest uh, example where uh, one just considers a, a molecule um, with a, a nuclei with uh, two states. And um, you can see here uh, how there is a, a matrix element that uh, represents the, the coupling strength and how it's dependent on the phonon energy and on, on the nuclear transition energy. And um, you can do the same thing for a more complex system, for a crystal. You also get your indirect coupling matrix element, um, and you can determine your, your phononuclear coupling strength. So that's, that is there. That sort of um, framework is there, um, and it can be modeled. Um, but for us, and especially for experiments, the most important question is how strong is this coupling? Um, how does it manifest, and, and does it lead to observable effects? And so for, for the, from this perspective, the most important thing we can pull out from these calculations is what are the uh, relevant variables? And so I list some of the relevant variables that um, come out of the, the models. And especially, I want to draw your attention to the energy in excited phonomons and the energy uh, of the nuclei involved. And, and so it's a simple picture that kind of emerges from that in analog to the earlier pictures um, of excitation, de-excitation is this kind of excitation by phon phonons and de-excitation by phonons. Um, but uh, that may not be the best implementation to observe this effect um, uh, uh, experimentally, because mostly uh, if you think about, uh, for instance, the 14 kV state of cobalt-57, you would need an awful lot of phonons. Um, and so that may be uh, part of the reason why some of the effects described here are so difficult to observe, because if you if you depend on a large number of phonons in your systems, you may not always get them when you need them. And so the question that kind of emerges from that is, are there any um, effects or mechanisms that lead to effects that manifest with, with fewer phonons? Um, and so here we come back to the modeling, and we come back to this um, uh, model of a molecule as sort of the simplest system. And if you start with excitation in your system already, and you have the coupling, uh, then your coupling strength goes way up and you need uh, way fewer phonons for achieving the same coupling strength. Um, <clears throat> so bringing that back to this picture, so you, you imagine you have a, a nucleus in a, um, a lattice and it's an excited nucleus and you uh, generate phonons in the lattice. You create this sort of quantum system here um, uh, as the coupling is happening, and you can uh, actually uh, transfer the excitation to another nucleus uh, uh, if you have matching levels here with only uh, uh, the exchange of two phonons. So that's a much more sensitive system uh, and much more likely or much easier to implement than the, the earlier sort of excitation from ground state system. And so if we, th if we take that into account and we consider now a system with um, where the energy, the phonon energy is given and the condensed matter environment is given, then basically the, the, the larger the nuclear levels are that we want to affect, the um, uh, smaller our coupling strength will be and uh, different effects will manifest. And I, I don't have time to go into the details here, but we expect to see anisotropy effects for the uh, higher nuclear levels and we expect to see delocalization effects for the lower nuclear levels. Here again, I use the uh, levels as examples for the materials that we work with, specifically cobalt-57. Okay, so all of this leads to um, the experiments. And so we expect that we see some changes in photon emission uh, in the presence of phononuclear coupling, uh, of relatively weak uh, phononuclear coupling. And um, we expect different effects for the different nuclear states that we're working, that we're working with. Okay, so now I come to the experiment. So I already mentioned we use cobalt-57 here. The 
the uh, energy levels, and particularly there's a 136 and a 14 kV state um, that is important to keep in mind. Uh, our sample is a steel plate where we evaporate cobalt-57. Um, and uh, here you can see a close-up of the, the source that's created in that process. This is a, a, a pinhole uh, X-ray uh, radiograph. Um, and um, here is our experimental setup, and we can apply the treatment, which, again, is the mechanical stress. Um, so this is a schematic. Um, and um, this was the first embodiment of this experiment. Um, and um, we had a scintillation detector at the top and a Geiger counter at the top. Um, and uh, we had an X-ray um, uh, gamma spectrometer at the bottom, which had a range from about 1 to 28 keV. So what you really get in this kind of scenario, what you can actually measure is the, the detector at the bottom sees the 14 keV lines, and the detectors at the top, they see the harder gammas that go through. Um, or they see, in this case of the scintillation detector, actually some X-ray fluorescence from the harder gamma on the backside of the plate. Um, so here are some of the spectra. Um, so this is the uh, AMTEC X123 gamma spectrometer. And then this one was not shown in the schematic. We later used an ORTEC um, spectrometer that has a full range up to about 140 keV. Um, so then we are interested, now we're interested in time histories. So if we take uh, the uh, X-ray spectrometer and we look at, for instance, here I, I have the peak the um, tin uh, X-ray fluorescence peak, and we have data here for about a month, and you can see how uh, it declines with uh, half consistent with the half-life of the cobalt-57, which is about 272 days. Um, so that's exactly what we expect, and everyone would be happy in, with this kind of data. And so uh, on the back side, the Geiger counter here, you have a week's worth of data um, that also decays at the, at the expected rate. Okay, so now we apply the treatment, which is we apply stress to the clamps, and we generate a stress field across the, the plate. Um, and so our first uh, implementation of this experiment, which actually wasn't really experiment, it was a sequence of experiments where we were looking for something else, and later we looked back and noticed this effect that I'm going to present. And I'm saying this because that's, that explains why some of the data looks a little bit messy, and some of our de detectors were used for the first time and still had some noise. But uh, I'm going to show you better quality data that followed from that later. But the first observation was that <clears throat> instead of this expected emission, uh, after applying the mechanical stress, we got an enhancement of emission from um, the, both the uh, nuclear line here and also uh, the uh, K-alpha and K-beta, uh, especially the K-alpha line, which um, uh, also is an output, uh, outcome of um, some inter internal conversion from the nucleus, um, the nuclei of the cobalt-57. So, um, also, what we observed on the backside is um, after applying the treatment, we get in the center, we get a, a, a reduction of emission, and at the, at the top, we get a, an enhancement of emission. And so that prompted us to try other variants of this experiment. So one thing we wanted to do is create stress in situ, um, because when you apply the mechanical stress in the early experiments, you have to take it off the rack and put it back on. And here we uh, basically generate stress in situ by applying heat, raising the temperature, and the plate expands and presses against the fixed clamps. And when we do that, we can actually now correlate the, um, the temperature here, which uh, causes the expansion. And then we can also see how the, the photon emission uh, is correlated with the, with the treatment. Um, again, here the K-alpha is um, also uh, influenced by the internal conversion apart from X-ray fluorescence. Um, also note there's different magnitudes of the effect for the different lines that is part of the, um, what Peter discussed as a, the, how the land ratio changes. It's part of the uh, observation here. So um, here I just uh, wanted to compare all of the different lines for this particular experiment. So you can see, again, the detector is actually working quite nicely. It's actually in this, this data was taken from this experiment over months. The uh, tin um, alpha line, which in this case, for, through X-ray fluorescence, integrates um, uh, over uh, most of the uh, harder gammas is actually showing exactly what we would ex expect. Um, and uh, then later we moved on to um, investigate this hypothesis that there are some delocalization effects here. So we put a pinhole on top, we put an uh, X-ray film on top, and uh, we took uh, X-ray images for 24 hours exposure. Here is a, a cold uh, before treatment image, and here is a, a during treatment uh, image. And uh, we created some heat maps from those. And so it's, 
it's hard to tell by eye, so it requires some analysis, and we're very early in this process, so we want to do more studies of delocalization, but some of the things um, we noticed is when you actually cut through um, uh, the image at certain lines, you can see a, a, a widening of where the ring, this, this ring is with a high concentration. But again, this is very early preliminary data. We need to get better data on this. Um, what we, this motivated us, though, to study with the X-ray spectrometer individual points. So here we're looking at this hotspot, which is a, an area of high concentration of emission. Um, and um, uh, here we get an uh, increase of emission. Okay. And uh, then we also study a, a, a spot outside uh, um, the hotspot. And here we, uh, again, this is very early data. This is not great data, but uh, it's leading us in a certain direction for better experiments. But here we see a reduction, at least uh, uh, tentatively. Um, and so um, this leads to some interpretations as to uh, what's going on um, with respect to delocalization effects. So now returning from the lower um, gammas to the higher gammas, to the high, harder gammas, um, uh, where we would expect weaker uh, phononuclear coupling and therefore uh, a, ra a rather angular effect instead of um, delocalization effects. And so this is one setup where we have uh, two different spectrometers looking at different angles um, and we can apply uh, treatment through mechanical stress. Um, so this is uh, the schematic of the setup, again, focusing on the harder gammas. And um, so what I m referred to in the earlier experiment was that we may, what we may have seen with the reduction at the center and the enhancement at the edges, that we get angular anisotropy, but we, we need better uh, data with better detectors. And so this is one um, experiment um, where we have the ORTEC um, a gamma spectrometer, and we have a, a, a shallow angle, and we apply, we let the sample sit for a long time, and we apply no stress, and so that's kind of a baseline control run. Uh, and here we have just uh, uh, applied mechanical stress, and you can see there is a, a, a reduction at this angle um, and um, uh, uh, with the two time constants. So coming, moving on from the data to the interpretation, the argument is that there's mechanical stress applied to the plate, which leads to uh, dislocation movement and, and friction, which generates terahertz phonons. I think this is pretty uncontested. Um, and then this ca causes uh, phonon nuclear coupling, which then manifests uh, uh, in, in these different effects uh, respective to the, uh, the, the nuclear um, transition energies. Um, so again, here, the uh, interpretation is that there's a stress strain field. We have ideas on how we can verify and measure that. Um, and the uh, interpretation of the delocalization is, is uh, in particular from the early results with the imaging um, uh, and the pinhole spe spectrometer uh, setup um, is that there is this hotspot on the plate, uh, on the substrate, and uh, uh, excitation actually tra where there's lots of uh, ground state iron 57 nuclei that can receive excitation from other excited nuclei and that some of the uh, excitation moves towards that hotspot. Again, that's the tentative um, pictures uh, at this point. Um, and uh, so that would, in terms of the schematic, that would basically mean, okay, so we apply the mechanical stress, we get the delocalization here, we apply for the lower, um, for the softer gammas and for the harder gammas, we apply the mechanical stress and, um, and we get the angular anisotropy, uh, angular anisotropy uh, effect. Um, so the next steps are to basically flesh out some of the data and get more data, get longer uh, series and get, uh, for instance, with the angular measurements, scan across uh, 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 more angles. Um, we want to do a high resolution raster scan um, to get a a uh, high resolution image at different uh, energy bands. Um, uh, we want to do x-ray camera imaging. Um, we want to ha have more systematic application of, of mechanical stress. Um, and we have uh, some ideas on how to create better samples that sh show larger effects. Um, and then lastly, it's very important to create a concrete model for this particular experiment. Uh, along the lines of what I uh, referred to in the introduction. So here's some of the setup. We have this um, XZ stage setup, which can move at three micron increments. And um, we, we have a, a grid uh, that we want to sort of cover um, for these measurements. We have a, a mechanical station that we're ready to deploy. Um, we played around with some uh, digital image correlation techniques to characterize stress drain fields. Um, and then we tried out um, different ways of uh, creating new samples. 
So in summary, we, I, we believe that, um, the, there is, um, that we are seeing phonon nuclear coupling based mechanisms and uh, effects in action and uh, that um, the observations are consistent with the picture I presented. Thank you, Florian. <laughs> So, so we have time for one quick question and quick answer. Especially, you never know. Oh, no. I'd like to acknowledge support from Industrial Heat for this work. Okay, that's what's good. Short and good. Is there any relation of, what you, of your findings with uh, the most power effect? Uh, yes. Can you tell us something about uh, that? I don't think he'll allow me to, but we, let's well, that talk will about be it. Well, in the bus, he can tell you all that. <laughs> anyway, we, have, we, don't, we don't have time, I'm sorry, because you have to take vacation this afternoon, so. In France, it is a must for vacation, so it should be here too. Okay, short maybe question. quick, short, very quick. Yeah. Is the source is implanted in steel, or you, have, you put the source on the just surface region? So, sorry, Cobalt source is implanted in the plate? source is evaporated, but we've also um, experimented with uh, electroplating, so we want to also try electroplating. But for now, it's evaporated. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll ask how, my how question. How do you later. get a contact strong? Okay. I, will, uh, I think we should wrap up and thank uh, Florian for his work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. Let me say one thing. Um, I'm very grateful to Professor Lee, who I met exactly 10 years ago at Tsinghua University and who introduced me to the field. And so yesterday was the first time in 10 years that we met again. So it was very nice. <laughs>